Hey. That was a little loud. Well, let me start over. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Haley. I'm thankful that Christ is here to celebrate this wonderful truth this morning. I'm glad you've joined us, and we're especially glad to have you with us this morning. You are our honored on the cake, as I like to say. We're delighted to see all of you here this resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this morning. And we're especially glad to have baby Leah here this morning. We praise the Lord with Zeke and Carrie and are rejoicing with them. What a wonderful first Sunday uh, for Leah to be here at church with us this morning. But we're glad to see played that song because we're going to sing it together now 273 273 now on the first we're going to dismiss our junior church students you're going to be dismissed on the very first verse and then on the last verse we'll have our uh, I invite you to stand with me as we sing 273 
But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. downtown people's bible church between the two of them they kept the church spick and span most of the other members had long ago moved to the suburbs but rose and henry faithfully maintained their quaint little stone cottage right next to the church 
The highlight of Rose's week was teaching the elementary school Sunday school class. She was forever looking for new ideas to keep the attention of her wiggling Bible scholars. When Rose showed Henry her latest brainstorm, he shrieked with laughter. What is it, Rose? A deformed onion? My lands, Henry. Haven't you ever seen a flower bulb before? Guess not, but why do you want to give them out to your Sunday school kids? Where's your imagination? Can't you see it's the perfect illustration of Easter? I think they'd appreciate onions a whole lot more, Rose. Don't you ever think of anything but food, Henry? Not if I don't have to. By the way, since you brought it up, what's for dinner? Flower bulbs. <laughs> now don't get worked up, Rose. I was just joking. Then you think it's a good idea? Dinner? No, Sally, the flower bulbs. I don't know, Rose. What are the kids supposed to do with them anyways? Well, they'll take them home, they'll put them in a flower pot, and they'll watch them grow. And then they can bring them back on Easter to our classroom. It'll be lovely. Sounds mighty complicated if you ask me, Rose. Can't you just do something normal for a change, like give out chocolate Easter eggs? How creative. Well, you can get them real cheap at the Walmart, you know. And what would the kids learn from chocolate Easter eggs, pray tell? Lots of things. Name one. Well, they learn uh, that Easter is a, 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 real, a, a real sweet time. Remarkable, Henry. I thought so. Besides, I could eat the leftovers. Oh, Henry. The following Sunday, Mrs. Kellogg gave an earnest Sunday school lesson before she distributed the bulbs to her class. She also gave each child a little booklet entitled, How to Plant and Care for an Easter Lily. Class, these flower bulbs are going to teach us something very, very important. They look dead, don't they? They're not very pretty to look at either. That by Easter, these bulbs are going to be transformed into beautiful stately Easter lilies. And that's the lesson of Easter. Almost 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself and was crucified on the cross to pay for our sin. When they put his body in the grave, not only was he dead, he was hor a horrible sight. The soldiers had beaten him so badly that he didn't even look human. But three days later, out of death came life. Out of ugliness came beauty. And out of the ground came the lily of Easter.
Some of the children looked bored and some pouted because the bowls were not cookies or candy. But there was one pair of elfish black eyes that never left Mrs. Kellogg's face. The two thin little hands tightly clutched the mysterious flower bowl. Those eyes and hands were strangers to the teacher. So when Sunday school was over... I don't believe I've seen you before, young lady. I can come here if I want. It's a free country, ain't it? Oh, of course it is, dear, and I'm glad you came. It just makes my day when I have a visitor in class. I ain't no visitor. I just came on a dare. A dare? Yeah, Big John said he'd give me a Snickers bar if I came to the rich folks' church. Rich folks? I may not be long here myself. They gonna kick you out too? Oh, child, nobody's gonna kick anybody out. Now come on, let's go to church. We can sit together. No, I gotta get home. I've been here long enough. What's the rush? It's a long time till dinner. I gotta, uh, gotta plant my onion before it dies. You said I could keep it, and you can't take it back now. Oh, I don't want it back, dear. I want you to keep, keep it so you can learn the lesson of Easter. Just promise me one thing. What? You'll be back next Sunday. I ain't promising nothing. Well, I'll tell you what. If you come back, I'll give you some fertilizer to help your flower grow. For free? Absolutely. Hmm, I'll think about it. With that, the mysterious little visitor was out the door like a... F she ran the six blocks to home to King George Street, burst in the front door, and flew up the stairs to her tiny attic bedroom. Polly Catherine Potter, don't you ever come crashing into the house like that again. Oh, I almost swallowed my false teeth. Sorry, Aunt Millie. Earl, Earl, you got to do something about that little tornado of yours. She's going to be the death of me. Sorry, Millie. Sorry, sorry. Sorry ain't enough. I want some peace and quiet. Is that too much to ask? Calm down now, Millie. Remember your blood pressure. Can't even watch a movie nowadays with that little wildcat tearing up the house. All right, I'll talk to her, Millie. After Earl's wife had left him, Millie had moved in with her brother, promising to be the mother that Polly needed. Unfortunately, Millie did little more than watch television, and Polly did pretty much as she pleased. Earl was kind to his only child, but a little afraid of her quick temper and sharp tongue. What are you doing, Polly? Uh, just thinking. What are you thinking about? Oh, just something. What do you got there? Got where? You ain't been stealing again, have you? No, I ain't been stealing again. Somebody gave me something for free. Is that a crime now, too? No, it's not. Not if that's really what happened. Dad, do flowers come from onions? Onions? Look here. What is it? Somebody told me if I put this thing in some dirt, it turned into a beautiful flower. They were lying, weren't they? I don't know. Of course, I don't believe a word of it. Do you? You're asking the wrong person, Polly. I don't know anything about flowers. You think maybe you could get me a flower pot? Maybe a real pretty one? Well, I'll see what I can scrounge up. Now don't tell on me, Dad. I know it's all just make-believe. And the kids would laugh at me if they found out. My lips are sealed. If anything happens, it'll be a surprise. And if it don't, you and me are the onlyest ones they'll ever know. Just don't get your hopes up too high. I reckon it'd take a miracle to get an Easter lily out of that. Looks dead, don't it? Deader than a doornail.
the next evening, Earl stopped by a garden shop and splurged on a small flower pot and some potting soil. He was glad that Polly had taken an interest into something harmless for a change. He was also pleased at the thought of a secret bond between them. When Earl got home, he quietly slipped into the house, snuck past Aunt Millie, who was absorbed in another television program. He tiptoed up the stairs and found Polly examining her flower bowl. When he took the flower pot out of the bag, Polly squealed with delight. Together they planted the bulb and sat it right in front of a small attic window. The next Sunday, Polly found her way back to Mrs. Kellogg's class. And after Sunday school, Polly had a thousand questions. I did everything just like you said, but there still ain't no flower. It's a trick, ain't it? It's no trick, Polly. Then when's it gonna happen? You've just gotta be patient, dear. But my Easter book has been in the ground for seven days, and you said it only took three days. Oh, child, I said Jesus rose, rose from the dead in three days. It takes Easter lilies a little longer. I knew it was too good to be true. But you're probably going to begin to see some signs of life before long. It's a miracle of Easter. Miracles don't really happen. Oh, yes, they do, child. I know firsthand. My wicked old heart used to be just like that flower bulb of yours, all shriveled up and dead. You ain't done a wicked thing in your life, and you know it. Oh, Polly, if you only knew. I've done lots of bad things, but when I asked Jesus to be my Savior, he forgave me, and he made me a new creation. He did a real live Easter miracle inside me. Did a flowers start growing out of your heart? Well, I never heard it put quite that way before, but there may be some truth in that. Did you remember to bring me some fertilizer? I sure did. It's right here in this little bag, and just follow the directions. And Polly, don't forget the water and the sunlight. I won't forget. Promise. <clears throat> Polly was more excited than ever. She ran all the way home, burst in the door, raced up the stairs to her room, once again scaring Aunt Millie half to death. Earl Watson Potter, if you don't civilize that little brat of yours, I'm going to have a heart attack. Calm down, Millie. Calm? How can I be calm when I'm having a heart attack? Billy, she's just a rambunctious kid. What am I supposed to do? Nail her feet to the floor. Put concrete in her shoes. I don't care. Just do something. I'll see what I can do. Well, get moving. I just missed my favorite commercial. Earl hurried up the stairs and stopped short at Polly's door. He proceeded cautiously. Millie's wrath was nothing compared to Polly's, so he entered slowly. Go away. Can I come in, Polly? No, I'm busy. But I'd really like to talk to you. Sorry. Just for a minute, well, please? Well, okay, but just for a minute. What are you doing? Just watching my Easter miracle. I don't see anything. That's because there ain't nothing to see. Oh, I'm sorry. I knew it was just a made-up story. I put fertilizer on it and everything. Don't give up just yet. It's only been a week. You haven't told me about my miracle, have you? Not even your Aunt Millie. Good. I'd be the laughing stock of the whole neighborhood if the kids found out. Even though Polly was losing hope, she faithfully watered her Easter bulb and moved it around her tiny room so that it got as much sunlight as possible. Rose Kellogg continued to pray for little Polly. The next night at dinner, Rose shared her concern with Henry. Dear Lord, we thank you for the food we are. Henry, sorry to interrupt, but we really need to pray for Polly Potter's bulb. Pray for what? Polly Potter. You remember, she's the little girl I told you about who lives down on King George's Street. Ah, yes, the little princess from King George's Village. Henry, I'm serious. We need to pray that Polly's bulb will sprout and sprout soon. Are you sure she didn't eat it? Henry. I'm sorry, honey, but I'm starved. Uh-oh, someone's knocking at the front door. I'll get it. Oh, no, sweetheart. Let me get it. You need to hurry and eat your dinner before you starve. What did I ever do to deserve such a wonderful woman? Oh, spare me, Henry. Oh, he hello there. Mrs. Kellogg, it's coming.
coming up. It's starting. When I got up this morning, there was five little green things peeking out of the dirt. Oh, that's wonderful, Polly. What do I do now? Well, you just wa wait and watch that Easter miracle happen. Is there really going to be a flower? A big, beautiful Easter lily. Well, I ain't saying I believe it, but if a real live flower comes out of that dirty old dirt, I'm going to do it to my heart, too. Do what? The Easter miracle. Polly sat in her room for hours studying each shining leaf of her developing lily. Every morning she woke up early hoping to discover new signs of life. When at last the first flower bud appeared, she clapped her hands and jumped up and down on her little bed. 
Earl Watson Potter, get up those stairs and tell that daughter of yours to pipe down. I'm trying to sleep. Polly, what's all the excitement about? Dad, it's coming true. It really is. What? My Easter miracle. Oh, what a cute little flower bud. If it happens, I'm going to do it too. Do what? Grow a flower right inside of my heart. What are you talking about? Quiet down up there. I'm going to throw you both out. Every Sunday, Polly faithfully reported to Sunday school to make sure she was doing everything right and to get more fertilizer. As Easter approached, she began to listen very attentively to every word of the Bible lesson. I can't believe it, teacher, my flowers this tall. And it's got two great big white flowers that just can't wait to pop open. Oh, Polly, isn't God's creation beautiful? It sure is, ma'am. Dear, isn't it about time that you became a new creation, too? Yes, it is, and I've got it all planned. You do? Yep, I'm going to do the Easter miracle on Easter. Polly, you know you're not the one that does the miracle. Jesus does the, mir the miracle. Then I'm going to ask him to do it on Easter. Are you sure you ought to wait, dear? Sure, I'm sure. I've thought about it a lot. I can't do anything to my flowers in full bloom. Why? Because I need it for my meeting. What meeting? My special Easter meeting. All through the next week, Polly was quiet and thoughtful. Many times, Aunt Millie looked at him curiously, wondering uh, what was wrong. Ain't sick, are you, Polly? No, just busy thinking about my Easter meeting. Your what? My meeting. I'm going to ask everybody in King George's Village to come over here on Sunday morning. Of all the harebrained ideas I've ever heard. Polly, we'd never fit everybody in here. Well, maybe they could stand out front, as long as they can see my surprise. What surprise? I can't tell you, or it wouldn't be a surprise now, would it? I've never heard of such crazy notions. That's what comes going up to that uptown church. Tony said he could bring his accordion and play something real pretty. I don't know, Polly. Oh, sure. And I can bake cookies for the whole neighborhood. Oh, thank you, Aunt Millie. You're the greatest. Polly, I, w I didn't mean... How generous, Millie. Oh. <laughs> Polly began to spread the word about her Easter meeting. She gave strict orders to everybody in the neighborhood to show up in her front yard at 11 o'clock, sharp on Sunday morning. Since she was so well known for her temper, nobody dared to refuse her to her face. When Easter Sunday finally arrived, Rose Kellogg had a flash of inspiration during breakfast. Henry, do you know where King George's Village is? Yes, I'm afraid I do have that honor. A most aristocratic neighborhood you could, would indeed. I need to go there today. Rose, it's Easter. I know, Henry, but I need to check up on one of my bulbs. I'm leaving right after Sunday school. You can't go to that slum alone. Oh, Henry, you're such a gentleman. Thank you for volunteering to drive me. I did? <laughs> right after Sunday school, Henry and Rose climbed into their 1975 Volkswagen Beetle and sputtered off towards King George's Village. They didn't have any trouble finding Polly's house. There were people everywhere. After Henry parked the car, he and Rose made their way towards the crowd. There, Polly stood on a rickety old front porch holding a magnificent Easter lily. It's the truth. I didn't believe it myself, but this flower used to be just an ugly brown onion. Are you sure you ain't lying, child? I promise, Aunt Millie. Then how come I ain't seen it before? I kept it a secret in my room. Folks, it's true. It happened just like she's saying. I saw it myself. Well, I'll be. And you know what? Every one of us is no better than an old, smelly onion, especially me. I've been ugly and hateful all my life, and you can't deny it, but I'm tired of it. Today, I'm asking Jesus to be my savior. I want him to change me and make me beautiful, just like my Easter lily. The tears started to flow, and Polly felt a kind arm slip around her shoulder. Rose Kellogg's sweet voice took over. Her lovely, glowing face held the attention of everyone. 
My dear friends, I want to tell you my favorite story in the whole world, the Easter story. 2,000 years ago, God looked down and saw that man was wicked and dead in sin. So he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay our penalty. After Jesus was crucified, his body was lovingly placed in a borrowed grave. But three days later, Christ arose and showed us the wonderful truth of Easter. What is this great truth? Jesus put it this way. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Rose Kellogg beautifully told the story of salvation that day, and many in King George's village became a new creation. Polly, true to her word, trusted Christ as her Savior, and so did her father. She proudly displayed her magnificent Easter lily in the front window all the next week, proclaiming to all the world that Jesus Christ does transform death into life and brokenness into beauty. Polly's life became a living example that Christ can make, a, make us into a new creation. Old things pass away and all things become new. these verses. These verses are characterized as the gospel. You'll see that word or hear that word as I read through these first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <coughs> Beginning in verse 1, the word of God says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Folks, I want to tell you about the gospel. Now, what does the word gospel mean? The bad news. It's the bad news that makes the good news good news. And later in these verses, we find out what the bad news is. 
two words that we're going to see in just a moment. The two words are our sins. Our sins. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Jesus Christ has paid for our sins. That's the gospel. That's the good news. It's that even though we're sinners, God has made provision for our sins. Well, let me keep reading. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. That's what you do with the gospel, the good news. You receive it. You receive it. Otherwise, it's still good news, but it does you no good if you don't receive it. So Paul says, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. That word saved means to be rescued. It means to be delivered. Paul said, you know what? I preach the good news of Jesus Christ to you, and you received it, and by it you were saved. By receiving it, you were saved. You were delivered from your sins. So he said, by which also ye are saved if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. In other words, Paul said, there's only one gospel. There's not a plan B and a plan C. So you're saved if you received the gospel that I preached to you. The true gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. You're saved if you received the true gospel. And he's going to explain to us what the true gospel is. He says, unless ye have believed in vain. Unless you've believed something other than the truth. Unless you've believed something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you. He's going he's gonna to tell them, here's what I preach to you. Here's the truth. Here's the gospel. That if you will receive, you will be saved. Here it is. He said... For I delivered unto you first of all. In other words, that means this is, this is the most important. First of all, that which I also received. Paul said, this is not my plan. These are not my ideas. I'm telling you what God gave me, what God told me. This is what I received of the Lord. This is not man's idea here. Here's what I received. How that Christ died for our sins. He died for our sins. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Now you say, well, why did Christ have to die for our sins? Well, you see, here's the thing about sin. And the Bible is very clear about this. Sin separates us from God. God is holy and can have no fellowship with sin. And we're sinners. You can look to the left of you and the person to the right of you. And you can look right up here. And I want to tell you something. We're all sinners. All of us. The Bible says for all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. I don't care who he is. Who she is. There is none righteous. No, not one. Listen, when it comes to sin, we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. And it's sinking. We're all sinners. 
That's the bad news. But the good news, the gospel, is this. Christ died for our sin. That's why he died. He died for our sins. He took my place on the cross of Calvary. He died in my stead. He became my substitute on that cross. He died for my sin. And he died for your sin. And Paul said, that's the gospel. That's the good news. Jesus Christ has paid for your sin. And he's paid for my sin. He said, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. In other words, according to God's word. And that he was buried. They placed him in that rock-hewn tomb. They placed him in that tomb. And they rolled the stone across in front of the mouth of that tomb. And they sealed that tomb. And they posted guard soldiers outside of that tomb. And they made it as sure as they could. Because they were aware that Jesus Christ said, I'll rise again in three days. I'll rise again. So they did everything they could to secure and seal that tomb. The gospel. How that Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and this is what Easter's all about and that he rose Again, the third day, according to the scriptures, he rose again. We serve a risen, living Savior. He rose again. He came out of that tomb. He defeated death. He defeated hell. He defeated the grave. And that's the gospel. And you know what Paul said writing to the Corinthians and writing to all who would later read such as we are doing today? He said, let me tell you about the good news. Let me tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're a sinner, but Christ died for your sin. He was buried. He buried your sin in the grave of God's forgetfulness. He took those sin, sins away. But oh, he didn't stay in that grave. Three days later, he arose victorious, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. All those things that threaten us, all of our enemies, he arose victoriously over all that could threaten us. And if you'll receive that, Paul said, if you'll receive it, you'll be saved. You'll be saved. You see, if you will put your faith, you've got faith in something. If I asked you this morning, I said, listen, do you believe in heaven? Maybe you'd say, yes, I, I believe in heaven. Then I might follow up with this question. Well, how are you going to get there? You might have an answer. You might say, well, I think if I'm good enough, I'll get there. Or you might say, well, I was baptized, or I'm a member of a church, or I've tried to be a good neighbor, or I've tried to do nice things. You've got faith in something. You believe something this morning. Well, I want to tell you, if you'll put your faith in the gospel, if you'll put your faith, if you will put your trust in the gospel, in what Jesus Christ did for you, if you will rest all of your hope, all of your weight on the gospel, on Jesus Christ, on his death, burial, and resurrection, 
If you'll put your faith in him, you'll be saved. And you will go to heaven. You'll be saved. You'll be delivered. You'll be rescued from your sin because Jesus already paid for it. But it is not efficacious or effective for you unless you receive it. Unless you receive what Jesus Christ did for you. Put your faith, put your trust, rest your all on the finished work of Jesus Christ. On the gospel. And you will be saved. I'm just going to read a couple more verses to you. And I just want you to think about them. Because again, these are not my words. This is what God says in his word. Just listen. Just think about it. Luke chapter 24 verse 46. Thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer. Talking about his suffering on the cross, and to rise from the dead the third day. There's the gospel. Acts chapter 17, verses 2 and 3. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. He, he preached to them out of the scriptures, Opening and alleging that, that Christ must needs have suffered. He told him Christ had to suffer on that cross. He must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And that this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is Christ. Jesus Christ. The word Christ, there's his title. It means he's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the promised one. He's the sent one. He is the one God sent to this earth to pay our sin debt, to save us, to rescue us, to redeem us, to remove that sin barrier that separated us from God. Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 10, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, by him doth this man stand here before you whole. A man had been healed. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. In other words, Paul Paul said, the, the writer said this. Peter actually was preaching here. And Peter said, you know what? You thought when Jesus Christ died on the cross that you were done with him? Oh, I want to tell you something. You're not done with Jesus Christ. God raised him from the dead, and he has become the head. He has become Lord of all and Lord over all. And you must come to Jesus if you want to be saved. That's the message Peter was preaching, just like Paul preached. And he went on, Peter went on to say this, Neither is there salvation in any other. You see, when it comes to salvation, salvation is exclusive. It's exclusive. There's only one way. His name is Jesus. There's only one gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Peter, looking at, over the crowd, he said, I want to tell you something. There is not salvation in any other. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's not another way. There's not another uh, name. There's not another gospel. There's only one. There's only one way. Can I say this? Jesus is not a good way to heaven. <laughs> He's not a great way to heaven. He is the only way to heaven. He is the only way to heaven. And he will save anyone. That's why he came. That's why he came. 
He will save anyone who will put their faith in him. In his death, burial, and resurrection. That's what today is all about. Last verse. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let us pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. You have not left us wondering how to get to heaven. You have not left us here trying to find our own way, trying to figure it out trying to discover how our sins can be forgiven, how we can have an eternal home in heaven. Father, you have told us. You have clearly revealed it to us. You loved us so much, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And we can have eternal life if we will receive him today. Father, I pray you'd work in hearts. You know each heart. I pray if there are those here this morning who have never put their faith, their trust, rested their all in Jesus Christ as Savior, I pray that this day, this moment, right now, Heavenly Father, they would call upon the name of Jesus Christ as their Savior, have their sins forgiven, know the joy of eternal life and being on their way to heaven. Would you work in each of our hearts? Thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that he is risen. Thank you that we serve a living Savior. And thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Would you join with me by taking your hymnals to 268? 268. The day would not be complete without singing this wonderful resurrection hymn together. I want you to think about the words as you sing them and the message of the words. Let's stand together. Lift our voices.
But it's exciting, isn't it? It's exciting to sing about our risen, living Savior. May the Lord bless you. I'm so thankful that you're here today. I'm so thankful that we could worship our Lord together this day. Brother Christopher McKay, would you dismiss us in prayer, sir?